The joy of a newborn soon leads to the entertaining discussion of whether the baby has his father's eyes or his mother's hair or his uncle's smile. For centuries, animal breeders and farmers have intentionally paired desirable male and female animals and plants to retain or accentuate certain qualities in their offspring. So, both in the resemblance of children to their parents and in the selective breeding of plants and animals, some idea about heritability has existed for centuries. The idea that traits are somehow transferred from one generation to the next. How this happens, that is, what the biological mechanism of inheritance might be, was unknown until the middle of the last century. That mechanism, of course, is now the expansive field of genetics. The coding and transfer of genetic information occurs in the form of genes, which are composed of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA for short. In the next two lectures, we will explore several fundamental topics in genetics. We'll learn exactly what a gene is, how a gene stores information, and how that information is used by the body to perform various functions. We'll also discuss a few of the many applications of genetics, both in agriculture and in medicine. By the end of the next lecture, you'll have a solid understanding of what we've learned so far about the code of life, its twists, turns, power, and potential. It may seem simple on the surface, but in fact, it's remarkably complex, and there are still many mysterious processes that are responsible for the vast and stunning diversity of all living things. I'd like to begin our story of genetics long before the discovery of genes or DNA and its now famous double helix structure. Let's go back to the mid-1800s to a monastery called St. Thomas's Abbey in what is now the Czech Republic. It was here with the pioneering work of Friar Gregor Mendel that the field of genetics was born. His passion for crossbreeding pea plants in the Abbey's garden revolutionized biology and medicine forever. Mendel was indeed a priest, and like many priests at the time, he was also an accomplished scholar with very strong training in biology, physics, astronomy, and meteorology. In fact, he was a founder of the Austrian Meteorological Society and an avid beekeeper and gardener. Yet for most people, the name Mendel is evocative of the simple pea plant. Specifically, his many seminal experiments on the patterns of inheritance when different varieties of pea plants were selectively crossbred. History tells that he also studied inheritance in bees and in mice, but it's been said that his superiors at the abbey were none too pleased about his invest investigations into animal sex. So Mendel focused his attentions on the harmless garden pea, Pisum satimum. Little did they know that peas could prove just as sexy and dangerous to church doctrine, or that Mendel's work would ultimately support Darwin's theory of evolution. As I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, it was well known in Mendel's time that creatures large and small pass on traits to their offspring. The dominant theory, however, was one of blending, that the characteristics of the parents are somehow combined, the result being an offspring having traits that were related, but not direct replications of parental traits, rather a sort of mixing of the two. Like people, many plants use sexual reproduction involving two parents to create offspring, and pea plants are among them. It's called cross-fertilization, although pea plants can self-fertilize as well. Resourceful little fellows, those pea plants. Mendel was interested in how traits were passed from one generation to the next. He often worked with two strains of pea plants, one with white flowers and one with purple flowers. He selectively interbred these plants to see how the offspring of his crossings turned out. According to the blending theory, mating white and purple flowers should produce offspring with a flower color that's a mix of the two, something like approaching purple or pink, but not quite white and not quite purple. But that's not what Mendel found. Instead, he found that the offspring plants had distinctly white or distinctly purple flowers, not some kind of blending. The traits that were inherited were discrete, not mixed.
But he also observed that the numbers of white or purple flowering plants in the next generation followed a specific pattern. And this discovery is what led to a paradigm shift in our thinking about inheritance. Let's walk through the results of a prototypical Mendel experiment to fully grasp this idea. First, let's take a white flowered pea plant and cross it with a purple flowered pea plant. We will find that all of the offspring have purple flowers. That's interesting. Despite having one parent with white flowers, that trait was apparently not passed down at all to its offspring. Instead, the purple colors seem to dominate the coloring of its children. Now, let's cross two of these purple-flowered offspring and observe their progeny. What we find is very interesting once again. We find that the majority of the new plants are, like their parents and their one grandparent, endowed with purple flowers. But white-flowered plants do make a comeback. In fact, we see that there is a ratio of about three to one purple to white flowered plants in this third generation. What's going on here? From these simple experiments, Mendel surmised two generalizations about inheritance that are now known as Mendel's laws of inheritance. These are the law of segregation and the law of independent assortment. The law of segregation states that for every characteristic, such as eye color or hair color, each parent possesses two possible versions of that characteristic, and that during the reproductive process, these two traits, known as alleles that we met in the previous few lectures, are separated, that is, segregated, with only one version passing on to the offspring from each parent. Mendel conceived of these separate versions as dominant and recessive traits. Going back to the pea plants, purple was the dominant flower color, while white was the recessive color, because when one white plant and one purple plant were crossed, all of the offspring were purple. So then, why do white flowers show up again in the third generation? That's where the second law that Mendel offered fits in. The law of independent assortment states that alleles of multiple traits segregate and are shuffled independently of one another. If you have two traits that get passed down, the alleles in each offspring are independent. That is, having one allele of trait A doesn't have any effect on which allele of trait B the offspring is likely to inherit. Mendel derived this law from experiments in which he tracked not one, but two traits across pea plant generations, like flower color, uh, pea size, or pea shape, for example. In essence, he found that the inheritance of these separate traits also followed patterns with three to one ratios, reflecting their own laws of segregation. That's because there are four possible ways that these alleles can recombine in future offspring. Let's say that there's one allele for white and one for purple. If you have at least one purple allele, the flower is purple, but if you have two whites and no purple, it's white. So in the third generation, you can have two purple alleles, one purple and one white, one white and one purple, or two white alleles. In the first three cases, whenever there is a purple flower, the offspring will have purple flowers, but one in four offspring, approximately, will have two white alleles causing a re-emergence of the white flowers in the three to one ratio. The same is true then of the other trait, the pea's shape, for example. So regardless of whether the offspring has purple or white flowers, the assortment of shapes will also follow the three to one ratio. What Mendel did not know, could not know, during his time, was the biological mechanism underlying the inheritance patterns that he observed. He inferred the existence of a heritable factor, but we know today that the units of inheritance are in fact genes with two alleles, one from each parent. I'm sure you've heard the, the term gene over and over again. The news is filled with stories proclaiming that the gene for this or that has been discovered, or we've heard people say that someone has good genes. Despite your familiarity with the term, Permit me to step back and describe what a gene is and how it's defined, because ongoing research is teaching us a lot that we didn't know before.
A gene is a distinct chain of DNA. That's a chemical compound called deoxyribose nucleic acid, which contains the biochemical instructions for the production of a protein. Genes and a lot of so-called junk DNA are coiled tightly into bundles called chromosomes. Junk DNA doesn't provide any code for proteins. That's the usual function of DNA or genes, but it likely has some other biological function related to genetics. We just don't know what that is yet. As I mentioned in the last lecture, we humans have two sets of 23 chromosomes, so 46 in total, in the nuclei of our cells. One set of chromosomes comes from each of our parents, so every gene has two alleles, one from mom and one from dad. With the sequencing of the human genome in the early 2000s, it was determined that there are approximately 20 to 25,000 genes in the human genome, which I must say came as quite a surprise. When I was in college, it was commonly estimated that there were upwards of 300,000 genes. Some geneticists say this new number, 20 to 25,000, might even decrease as we learn more. The kinds of inheritance patterns that Mendel observed, such as the ones I described earlier with the flower colors of pea plants, are characteristic of so-called monogenetic traits. That is, traits determined by a single gene. There's just one gene that determines whether a flower is purple or white. With one set of chromosomes from each parent, there are actually two copies of each gene, therefore two alleles. The two alleles are then subject to the laws of segregation and independent assortment, yielding the simple 3 to 1 ratio among third generation offspring that Mendel discovered. Many of the complex traits that interest us, however, such as physical or cognitive skills, depend on the contributions of many genes, so simple Mendelian patterns of inheritance do not occur. Instead of a 3 to 1 ratio, the pattern is much more complicated and harder to analyze. But that's not to say that single gene traits and a Mendelian inheritance can't be observed in humans. The presence or absence of a pointed hairline, for example, across the forehead, also known as the widow's peak, is a benign but observable trait known to follow Mendelian inheritance or the 3 to 1 ratio. More importantly, there are numerous diseases that are caused by mutations in a single gene, such as cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, sickle cell anemia, and those diseases can be found to run through families, also in a Mendelian inheritance pattern. Let's get back to the language of life, DNA. What is this mysterious DNA? You can think of DNA as a simple language, a code, like Morse code, that can be read by the cell's machinery to produce new cellular components called proteins. This is an important point. When you hear all the hubbub about genes for this and genes for that, remember what a gene actually is and what it does. It's just an instruction sheet for the production of a single protein. Let's not forget that if cells are the building blocks of our bodies, proteins are what keeps them functioning. They are the agents that are responsible for all of the actions of our cells. When I remember this point, it helps me retain a level of skepticism about genetically based explanations for complex behavior. When scientists study the genetic underpinnings of various traits or diseases, they are rarely, if ever, trying to pinpoint a specific gene that causes an observable phenomenon. Such situations are rare, and most have already been documented. The majority of physical features and diseases are the result of the complex interaction between many genes and the environment. The question that scientists typically ask is, can variations in specific genes be identified that correlate with variations in the trait of interest? Note that we say correlate, not cause. The results of such studies often identify genes that account for a small yet significant amount of variability in the trait, and therefore are suspected to be involved in that trait. No geneticist would claim the result such as this is equivalent to finding a gene for X. But what they can say is that the alteration of a gene by way of its gene product matters in some observable way to an otherwise complex phenomenon like obesity or depression.
Such studies are important because they link genes and the basic biochemical physiology of the cell to broader biological processes. This linkage not only leads to a better understanding of how the body works, but can also identify potentially useful diagnostic tests and new drug targets to maintain health or cure diseases. Without getting into a lot of chemistry, the important thing to remember about DNA is that it utilizes four bases, which are four specific compounds that each contain nitrogen. Technically, they are called nucleobases, but we use base for short. Now, don't confuse these bases with the kind that are the opposite of acids. These bases can be thought of like letters in the alphabet, such that different combinations of them form different genes, like different combinations of the same 26 letters of the English alphabet make up many different words. In fact, these four letters, or bases, make up the entire alphabet of our genetic code. The four bases are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, each made up of different combinations of nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. They are commonly referred to by their first letter, so that's A, G, C, and T, and their different combinations of elements give them different shapes. The structure of DNA is quite amazing, actually. As you've probably heard, it exists as a so-called double helix, which looks like a twisting ladder. The twisting DNA ladder, the double helix, is actually two separate strands of DNA bound together like a zipped up zipper. The rungs of the DNA's twisted ladder are the bases, the A, G, C, and T's. It turns out that the bases have natural pairs, natural preferred partners to which they bind. A and T bind together while G and C prefer each other. So when we think about a DNA molecule, we should think about a gently winding double helix in which bases are binding to each other, the A's with the T's and the G's with the C's. It is the pattern of these A's, G's, C's, and T's that makes up our genetic code. So when you hear about gene sequencing or about the sequencing of the human genome, you're hearing about the reading out of very, very long strings of these bases. How long? The 20,000 or so protein coding genes in the entire human genome contain a total of about, of about 3.2 billion base pairs. When geneticists talk about genes, they often use kilobases or 1,000 bases as a unit of length. How do DNA's base pairs store information and how is the information read? Recall that earlier I said that genes are an instruction manual for the production of proteins. At the molecular level, proteins are just precisely folded and decorated polypeptides, that is, amino acids strung together. Amino acids are small molecules that are the building blocks of proteins, and Mother Nature uses 22 of them in the construction of a wide variety of proteins. As an aside, you might have heard the term amino acids before in the context of nutrition. Indeed, it turns out that nine of the 22 standard amino acids needed for protein production are called essential amino acids, because the human body cannot create them, but rather must ingest them through eating. I touched on this a little bit in the second lecture. These essential amino acids can be obtained in protein-rich foods, say, in eggs, fish, and soy. But how is it that DNA in genes is turned into proteins? This process involves two important steps called transcription and translation, and a few biochemical players to help get the jobs done. In essence, transcription and translation involve copying the information in DNA, putting it in portable form, and transporting it out of the nucleus to the other parts of the cell where the cell's manufacturing machinery can construct the new protein. Keep this simple workflow in mind as we explore the details. Working like the scribes of yesterday, the process of transcription copies the DNA code into a new message called RNA, or ribonucleic acid. DNA and RNA sound like they might be similar, and in fact they are. They are both nucleic acids, and almost the same bases are the letters of their alphabets. Like DNA, RNA also has a four-base alphabet with which it stores information, but there is one small variation. RNA uses uracil instead of thymine as the binding partner for adenine.
Why would the transcription process over our, ev our evolutionary past select for uracil instead of thymine? Because one of the other bases, cytosine, can spontaneously turn into thymine. If this happens during transcription, the information contained in the separate bases would be lost. So it seems that Mother Nature may have modified thymine into uracil to prevent this problem. So RNA's alphabet is G, A, U, and C for the nucleotides guanine, adenine, uracil, and cytosine. Remember that genes reside within chromosomes in a cell's nucleus. In terms of genetic information, then, the nucleus is like a library from which you can't check out the books. They are housed in the reference section. So you have to copy the information by hand. What's fascinating about DNA and RNA is that they are well designed to be replicated effectively. Remember that A, G, T, and C have specific binding partners. Therefore, if you know one nucleotide, you know the other half of the rung. And that's what happens with transcription. A key player in DNA transcription is an enzyme called RNA polymerase that performs the transcription process. RNA polymerase binds to the DNA and acts to separate the DNA's bound base pairs, effectively unzipping the double helix. As it does so, moving across the DNA strands like a, the slider body of a zipper, the RNA polymerase reads the DNA sequence and creates a complementary matching sequence of RNA. So, for example, if the DNA reads A, A, G, C, G, A, then the RNA polymerase will create an RNA molecule consisting of the correct matching sequence, U, U, C, G, C, U, which retains the information in the DNA. The component parts for the matching sequence are just floating around in the nucleus, available for use by the RNA polymerase. The double helix reforms behind the RNA polymerase, and the new RNA sequence is released a fresh Xerox copy of the DNA from which it was derived. The new RNA sequence now contains the instructions for assembling the peptides that will make up a new protein. As I mentioned earlier, however, a lot of the information in our DNA is junk, or at least its purpose is not entirely clear, but it's not involved in creating new proteins. So one intermediary step that occurs after RNA synthesis is that the unneeded bits of RNA copied from the pieces of junk DNA, which are called introns, by the way, are cut out, leaving just the RNA needed to create the new protein. An abridged version of the full DNA reference book, if you will, the Cliff Notes or Reader's Digest version. So now we've got our messenger RNA and we use that to construct a new protein, a process called translation. Translation is how the nucleic acid code of the RNA is deciphered or translated into a polypeptide sequence. We learned earlier that there are 22 amino acids that are used to construct the peptide sequences of proteins. And there are four bases used in RNA, so clearly there can't be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the identity of the base and the corresponding amino acids. This is true, and how RNA was translated remained a mystery until the 1960s when a number of researchers, including Nobel Prize winners Nirenberg, Holly, and Korana, cracked the RNA code and decrypted the language of protein construction. It turned out that triplets of nucleotides correspond to specific amino acids, like little three-letter words. For example, the triplet UGU corresponds to cysteine, while GCU stands for alanine. These triplets are known as codons, and there are 61 that code for amino acids. There are three additional codons that code for the instructions start and stop, similar to a telegraph message. Dear mother, stop. Catching train to Boston, stop. See you in a day's time, stop. The key player in messenger RNA translation is the enzyme complex called a ribosome, which we met in lecture two. Similar to the way RNA polymerase interacts with DNA, the ribosome binds to the RNA and moves across the sequence, reading the codons in turn, and catalyzing reactions that sequester and add amino acids found in the soupy milieu of the cell into an elongated chain. As you now know, amino acids come from protein in our food, but also from the byproducts of recycled proteins. The creation of the elongated chain ends when a ribosome encounters a stop codon. The product of this process is the polypeptide that will become part of a protein, 
or a protein in and of itself. Keep in mind that the entire process of translation occurs very quickly, in a fraction of a second. In addition, a single messenger RNA sequence can be translated by multiple ribosomes simultaneously, like an assembly line, each producing polypeptides for new proteins. The life of the newly translated protein then proceeds in many different ways, depending on the role that the protein will play. The polypeptide is folded into a unique three-dimensional structure and then transported to the parts of the cell where it is needed. The general process of translating and transcribing a gene that I just described is known in biology as gene expression. You might come across this term in the news articles or on the internet, so now you know what it means. You also may have learned that every cell in your body contains the same genetic material, and that's true. But it's the differences in gene expression patterns that are responsible for the diversity of tissue and cells in our body. Bear in mind that gene expression is not a process that occurs continuously. That is, your cells aren't continuously expressing all 20,000 or so genes in your genome. Some genes are expressed during normal development, while others are expressed only in specific tissues, and others still in specific cells in the same tissue. Where and when genes are expressed depends on many factors, including both biological and environmental influences. This is why the historical debate regarding nature versus nurture is so specious, at least at the genetic level. Gene expression is both the result of nature and nurture. It's like asking which leg is more important for walking, the right or the left. They are both intimately involved and indispensable. There are strategies such as studies of identical twins through which scientists can measure the relative contributions of hereditary and environmental influences on a trait of interest. But I would encourage you not to fall into the trap of thinking that genes entirely and irrevocably determine our characteristics. For example, problems with eyesight are highly heritable. But that doesn't mean that you can't get a pair of eyeglasses or undergo LASIK surgery both environmental influences, to achieve near-perfect vision, even if you were born with bad genes. Yes, there are genetic differences between individuals, so one should expect a whole range of abilities and traits among different people. This is the fuel of natural selection, as you now know. But we should always keep in mind the important interactions between genes and environment when so-called experts offer generalizations. Are women bad at math? Are men less sympathetic than women? It's difficult to imagine a scenario in which such complex traits are genetically determined and insensitive to environmental and societal influences. We've come a long way since Mendel first bred his pea plants. We now know that genes serve as the basic unit of heritability, and each gene provides the instructions for the production of a protein. We even know the structure of every single strand of our DNA. But it turns out that heritability is more complicated than we originally thought. In fact, there are several ways in which the patterns and timing of gene expression can be modified that do not involve any changes to the underlying nucleotide sequence in the DNA. In the past 20 years, a new field has emerged that is devoted to studying this phenomenon, epigenetics. The prefix epi is Greek, and it means above or on top of. So this new branch of genetics is exploring something that seems to be on top of our genes. Understanding epigenetics is now one of biology's major goals. Why? Because many of the disease treatments that we currently have are ineffective, since environmental differences between individuals have such a strong effect on gene ex expression. Sorting out which factors are important and which aren't may well usher in a new era of personalized medicine, revolutionizing our approach to our own health. We'll take a closer look at epigenetics and its promise in the next lecture.